Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. This session will begin momentarily. Has, have you, have you done this room before? No. It has really it's good acoustics. So I think it, it's a very warm Conference space. And so I think oh, it will... Okay. Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Which is I have years. Years. Yeah, it's a good Thank spot. you, everybody. At, like, yeah, I have to do all these books. I, I said fall. something. I, I announced like, our hello? Our hello? Hello? That I was yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, folks. And we're going to try to get started here to keep on time, if that's all right. Don't mind taking your seats. Please. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my name is Camille Foster. Um, I am a partner in a company called FreeThink. We are a media production company. We create a lot of original content, uh, as we describe it, for and about the next generation of leaders. Um, I am delighted to be here today. Thank you very much to, to John and to everyone at Heterodox. Um, this is a, a real privilege, and I think we've got a really great panel lined up for you. I'm going to do my best to, to stay out of the way today. Um, and try to keep the conversation going. Uh, there is a diversity of perspectives that are represented in this great panel. I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves as they provide their opening remarks. Um, but what I, I want to highlight are a couple of things about the panel. First, that their academic and intellectual pursuits uh, sort of run the range of some of the most discussed and controversial issues um, in our society and culture and politics. Um, it's race, gender, sex, um, and uh, religion, uh, and increasingly something that might be described as the free speech crisis. Um, here, we've talked about it a lot in the context of the university, um, but there is obviously a broader context as well. People leave the university, uh, and they do various other things, and I'm sure um, some of you have encountered uh, what you might perceive as a changing cultural climate in your everyday lives. Uh, we're going to try to expand the conversation to, to some of those broader things uh, right now. Um, along the way, uh, we'll also devote some attention to something else that's been mentioned a few times, this, this concept of viewpoint diversity. Um, and we will, I think, investigate the challenges that are inherent in achieving it and maintaining it. Um, and we'll also talk a bit about the limitations of viewpoint diversity and potentially its drawbacks. Uh, something else important that I'd like to highlight really briefly um, is that within this diversity of perspective, there are certainly some shared values, um, inclusiveness, well-being, open inquiry, uh, productive debate. These are things that everyone uh, arrayed here um, are generally interested in. There may, in fact, be some definitional questions there that we'll have to get to uh, because oftentimes we'll use the same words and not necessarily mean the same things. Uh, but I think we will have a great, robust exchange Last thing I'll say about viewpoint diversity uh, briefly, because I think it might be helpful to contextualize it for folks watching at home who may just be tuning in, um, is that while this is the raison d'etre of heterodox, I, I don't think it's fair to say that it is an end in itself. It is a methodology. The goal is to try to achieve those values via viewpoint diversity, um, and also to try to overcome these cognitive biases that we all are subject to in various contexts. To the extent we can do that, um, it may be a necessary condition, uh, but it isn't uh, sufficient in and of itself. 
um, and there may in fact be ways in which it creates challenges for us. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna kick this to the speaker uh, and to begin the conversation, I'm gonna do it with, uh, with a question uh, just to open things up and we'll sort of roll down. And again, please introduce yourselves uh, as you're answering. But the first question is, with respect to the academy and society more broadly, how would you describe the prevailing culture of free expression? Uh, do you detect some sort of erosion in our collective capacity for productive discussions? And as you're answering the question, I'm particularly interested in the factors that lead you to your particular conclusion. Okay. So, so uh, hi, I'm, I'm Shadi Hamid. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. I write on religion and politics, but particularly one religion, Islam. So that gets me in various uh, controversies. So just to, so um, just, I'll start with an anecdote. This actually just happened yesterday, and it fits very well with, I think, what we're trying to talk about here. But um, I agreed to speak um, at a conference that has some problematic figures, and there have been calls on me to withdraw. And I think this debate that I'm now part of in regards to this conference gets at some fundamental questions about viewpoint diversity. But basically, um, I, I said yes to this, and there are the problematic figures in question are primarily Sam Harris, um, Majid Nawaz, and A.N. Hirsi Ali. Well, but, but I, the thing is, I do actually disagree profoundly with all three of them, and I've been a, a very big critic of A.N. Hirsi Ali in particular, so people were asking me, what, you know, what is, your, what is your red line? Who are you not willing to speak with? Who do you actually consider beyond the pale, so to speak? And at some level, there are people we won't agree to speak on a panel with. So I, I started to think more about where would I draw my, my own line? Um, and then people were bringing up, oh, you wouldn't speak with people who are anti-Semitic or KKK members. And I'm like, well, I have my issues with some of these people. I don't think they're quite equivalent to the KKK. Um, but then there is the question of what am I not okay with? What are we not okay with? We're all heterodox, but we presumably do have our limits. And I, and I responded to someone who was calling on me to withdraw um, kind of flippantly, and I said, I won't speak with terrorists. I won't be on a panel with terrorists. Um, and I actually think that gets somewhat close to my actual position now that I'm thinking about it a little bit more. And not that this is a big issue because Al Qaeda members aren't really speaking on college campuses <laughs> as far as I know. But you know, <laughs> so, um, so that, that, and I think that having, because otherwise where we draw the line is ultimately going to be arbitrary. And what I've realized over the past years, as the past couple years, I've been speaking more to diverse groups about Islam, Islam's role in public life, including um, evangelical audiences, let's say. And I've realized that evangelicals think um, that abortion isn't just a me metaphorically like murder, but in some cases, is actually equivalent to murder. And I'm pro-choice, so presumably they think that I support murdering innocent people, right? But we presumably, we wouldn't want to block someone who's pro-choice from speaking on a panel. And if, if evangelicals were calling for that, we would say that's not okay. And then we start to see how arbitrary these distinctions are depending on where you are on the political spectrum. Because I've worked a lot on the M Middle East and spent time living in the Middle East, um, I also, w one good thing about living in that, in that part of the world is you get used to very objectionable views and you just start to develop <laughs> a tolerance for them. And just to give one example on that is that my, I have um, my relatives in Egypt. I'm born and raised here, but I'm originally um, Egyptian. Um, I have relatives who support the mass killing of innocent civilians. And I don't mean that hyperbolically. They actually supported a massacre that happened in August 2013, which was the worst mass killing in modern Egyptian history. And we've had debates about this, but I'm not gonna no platform my uncle or my cousins or my relatives. And um, I don't think that um, most of the people who we consider objectionable here in the US, most of them don't support the mass killing 
of innocent civilians. So as long as they don't, I'm actually, I actually think that I might be okay being on a panel with them. So to the narrower question briefly before we move on, do you see some sort of erosion in our ability well, to have these conversations? Well, yeah, or? I mean, so it, when I heard these calls to with, withdraw yesterday, I, uh, it didn't even occur to me. So I, I said, oh, I'm speaking on this panel with so-and-so. I didn't even realize that this would be a big controversy. I'm not really, uh, I'm not on a campus right now, and I'm not, um, I'm not someone who is very, very much part of this politically correct scene. So I don't, I don't always know where the sensitivities are. But what's troubling to me is now I always have to be, I have to be more attuned to it. And that's not something I felt necessarily two or three years ago. And going back a little bit to even when I was an undergrad, this, a lot of this stuff seems really foreign to me. Um, and I think part of that is because when I was an undergrad, we were dealing with a fundamentally different set of questions. We're, we were dealing with the Iraq War, and as someone who was very involved in the anti-war movement at that time, and also post 9-11, it also has made me think that, not that we should have wars to shift the campus debate to things that are more fundamental, but I do think when you are facing these much, these much bigger issues of war and peace and soldiers dying and the killing of, of uh, Iraqi civilians, the kinds of debates that we're having about what pronoun to use seem kind of absurd to me. I, and just, so I, I do think that is, that, that is a shift. Okay, yeah. got it. Alice, please. Uh, I'm Alice Drager. I don't ever know nowadays how to describe myself, so I'll say I'm a professional pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, my PhD is in history and philosophy of science, and I was an academic until a couple of years ago. I resigned my position at Northwestern University. I was a full professor of medical humanities and bioethics at the medical school, and uh, my dean censored an article that I edited and published, and I don't mean censored in the light sense of he prohibited it from being published. It had already been published, and he required it be withdrawn. Uh, it was a story about oral sex in a medical setting. And um, you can read it online, and it will not actually titillate you as much as it did my dean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I tried fighting it for 15 months and finally gave up because I had just published a book called Galileo's Middle Finger, which is about um, the suppression of academic freedom. So I told him I couldn't take the irony overload. It was going to kill me. Um, but the truth is, the reason I resigned was because my colleagues were in a position where either they were going to have to put up with me and they were going to worry that I was going to, they were very supportive of me in all my work. And my work has always been very controversial in various areas. But they were worried that if I kept doing the kind of work I did, I was going to irritate the dean enough that our program might be disbanded. So my choice was between loyalty to my work and loyalty to my colleagues, and I found that intolerable. So I left so as not to harm my colleagues further. Um, one thing that I think is really important as we think about the crisis of academic freedom and free speech on campus is not to forget the influence of corporatization. And in fact, when we were talking in the last session about why don't act administrators uh, act up more in terms of protecting freedoms, I think a big reason is because we have had the corporatization of universities and we've gotten ourselves into a position where the risk managers are making a lot of the decisions that the faculty should be making. And I, I'm not joking about that. I, that's really true. And so that's become a big problem. Um, you know, it, it's gotten to the point where people think of universities as brands. And um, so parents are very concerned to get their kids the best brand. And this becomes a problem. So as my son was applying to University of Chicago, and there was the whole question of Steve Bannon coming to campus, a woman who's a friend of mine who's an academic actually said to me, well, do you really want your son going to a place where Steve Bannon might speak? To which my response was, I want Steve Bannon to expose himself to my son. And then I realized that didn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, I'm happy to say my son got into University of Chicago and is going there, which is the ultimate screw you to Northwestern University. Um, so I, I proudly wear, whenever I go back to Northwestern to speak, the University of Chicago mom shirt. Uh, but you know, we, we do have a problem with the corporatization and the influx of this corporate mentality, which is very, I think, opposed to the traditional idea of the university. A brand is a singular message. 
A university cannot have a singular message. So sort of riffing on what John was saying earlier, you know, John and I very much agree that loyalty and tribalism become a big problem within university settings and within any democratic system. So he was talking about trying to get to the point where Chicago's at of using school pride, using tribalism, right? But creating a new kind of tribalism that then undermines the problematic tribalism. I think similar to that, what I would say is what we need is a new kind of branding within universities where the brand is about diversity of opinions and diversity of viewpoints and challenging each other's and seeking data and these kinds of things. And if we can do that at more universities, then we have some hope. But we have a wider cultural problem where we have a system where money is using us to uh, make us fight with each other and then dampening it down when it turns out that's not good for business. So the example I'll give you, I, I, was, I live in a one-party town, East Lansing, Michigan. It's a very blue town. I'm a progressive Democrat, but whenever you're in a one-party town, it's a problem. So we have no newspaper, and four years ago I finally decided I had to solve this problem, so I started a newspaper. It's a citizen journalist, nonpartisan, nonprofit news organization that I think has now become a model for the rest of the country, so I'm going to try to propagate it around the rest of the country. But what, as we do nonprofit news, it's really interesting to me to teach people to do nonpartisan news, because almost everybody on my team is left of center. And what I found over and over again is I had to do the most basic education with people of what nonpartisanship looks like. In this country, all over the world, because of the internet, there is more money to be made in opinion than there is in news. And over and over again, what we see is a situation where opinion is profitable and opinion is therefore valued and news, especially nonpartisan objective news, is not valued. And so you get into a situation where people are increasingly used to market opinions. And this becomes deeply problematic. So the most recent example I will give you is that those of us who work in the news business have this huge problem with Facebook. Because of Facebook being hacked basically by the Russians for purposes of interfering with our elections, what has now occurred is that Facebook has become terribly afraid of promoting political advertising. So if we try to publish any article and boost it on Facebook, and we have to because about 52% of my readers at my newspaper come through Facebook. If we try to boost anything on Facebook that has anything like the word election, uh, polling, campaign, or even government, Facebook labels it political advertising and refuse to allow us, us to promote it. So as I'm trying to promote a FAQ about an income tax proposal in East Lansing that comes on the ballot August 7th, Facebook will not allow me to get this basic FAQ nonpartisan information to my readers through Facebook because they say it's political advertising. So what we see happening is the shutting down of objective news, of nonpartisan news, and this ultimately affects us within the academy because the students who are now coming to us are coming to us from a world that doesn't have a normal kind of nonpartisan information flow. It's not just the universities, it's all over the place in which there's more money to be made by promoting opinion and then shutting it down when it becomes unprofitable. And that to me is the bigger danger. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Angus Johnston. I'm a historian of student activism. I, I teach at the City University of New York, University of New York um, uh, specifically at Hostos Community College in the Bronx. I think I'm the first person to speak today who is presently affiliated with a public college or university, so that's kind of cool. Um, thank you. Um, uh, and you know, I, I, I've written a lot about American student activism in the uh, 20th century, uh, and I've worked with a lot of contemporary student activists, um, and done a lot of, of writing more recently about what's going on on the contemporary campus. And I, I think to answer your question about you know, where we are in in the dialogue and in, in free speech right now. I think, on the one hand, I would say that I'm a lot more optimistic uh, than a lot of people in this room, um, precisely because I think that what uh, a healthy uh, environment for free speech and dialogue looks like is contentious. I think that people being mad at each other, I think people yelling at each other, I think people getting angry and upset with each other is part of what dialogue and debate and free speech looks like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we are not in a time when we are particularly civil uh, at this moment. We are not in a, a time when we are 
uh, particularly polite to each other and nice to each other, but I'm not a big fan of civility and politeness and niceness. I think, I think that, that robust and vigorous and disruptive uh, uh, debate and argumentation is really important. And, and that gets to what you said in, in your introductory statement that um, you know, viewpoint diversity and freedom of speech and dialogue are not ends in themselves. They are means toward ends. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to look at is, is what those ends are. And we need to have a conversation about, about what our goals are. Because often, I think, critics um, of disruptive speech um, are not really clear on what the goals of that disruptive speech are. And I think we need to, to bring that to the fore, uh, forefront and make that a little bit more explicit. Because if my goal in my speech is one thing and your goal in your speech are two different, is, is something else, then we're going to have two different conceptions of what that speech should look like and how that speech should work. Um, and you know, I think one of the things that's gone largely uh, unremarked upon uh, in, so far today is the fact that we're in the middle of, of a tremendous civic crisis in this country, right? We, you know, setting aside um, all of the stuff that the Trump administration has been doing uh, since it came to office, two of the last five presidential elections in the United States have resulted in the person who lost the popular vote taking office. That's a crisis, I think. Um, and I think that what has happened since uh, January 20th, uh, 2017 is, is a major and mounting crisis. And I think that the way that people are engaging in speech, not just around political issues, but around all, a whole bunch of things, is, is reflective of the fact that, that people perceive us to be in a very, very profound crisis. And I think we need to engage with that. Um, and, and one other thing I, I think that's important to note is particularly when we're looking at the campus, I think that there is a bit of historical myopia um, that gets us in trouble when we're thinking about what speech looks like and what speech should look like. Um, when you come to an event like this, there's always the invocation of the Berkeley free speech movement and this, this narrative of declension, right? That was what free speech really looked like on campus and, and what we have now is something different and something worse. Um, but if the Ber Berkeley free speech movement happened today, it would be wildly unpopular with huge numbers of people, including, I'm gonna say, a lot of people in this room, right? The Berkeley free speech movement was, was kicked off by thousands of students gathering around a police car to prevent somebody from being arrested and stopping the police from doing what they were supposed to do and sitting in around that police car for 32 hours and delivering speeches from the top of that police car. And if you look at the photos, you will see that the, the hood and the roof of that car are essentially caved in by the end of it. And a lot of people would say, including, again, some people in this room, that that's, that's not the kind of dialogue that we're looking for, not the kind of speech that we're looking for. And, you know, I know that this, this particular quote is going to be one that's familiar to a lot of you, but I think it's important to, to bring it out every once in a while. Um, this is the, the peroration of Mario Savio's speech in December 1964 at one of the great um, rallies of the free speech movement. And I want you to think about how this would be covered in the media and how this would be covered by free speech defenders, uh, specifically in the media, uh, if this were a speech that were given uh, on an American campus today and went viral uh, on Twitter. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the opera apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. This is not a call to debate. This is a call to disruption. This is a call to put your bodies upon the gears and the wheels and the levers. Um, and I think that, that when we're trying to understand the nature of protest, it's very, very important for us to understand that protest and debate are two very, very different things. 
that if Mario Savio and the free speech movement at Berkeley had been passing resolutions and hosting debates and engaging in dialogue with each other and in you know, challenging the administration to have an open forum discussion in an auditorium on campus, none of us would know who they were. None of us would remember them today. And I know that because before the free speech movement, there were huge numbers of liberal progressive activists who tried to change the university using exactly those methods, and they failed. And they failed, where the Berkeley free speech movement succeeded because they were willing to put their bodies upon the wheels. John. Um, my name is John McWhorter. I teach linguistics and philosophy and music history at Columbia. University, and I would say that um, the place that we're at now in terms of campus debate, um, with all due respect for what you're saying, Angus, I completely understand. I used to teach at Berkeley. I'm a great admirer of Mario Savio. I have that speech memorized, actually. <laughs> Still, I think that there has been a sea change. Um, I noticed it in specifically the year 2014 in teaching my classes that it got harder to have an open discussion. Nobody was throwing Molotov cocktails or anything, but it got to the point that a certain minority of students could swerve or even stanch discussion with what I think many of us are now familiar with as what's called the, the social justice warrior ideology. And it does worry me, and the reason it worries me is because I think there's a difference between debate and even healthy debate, and no, debate is rarely tidy, it never has been. But there's a difference between debate and something that's a religion. And I must make it clear that when I use the word religion, I'm not trying to use it as a battering ram. I don't mean it to be funny. I mean that there actually is something that has settled in, in our campus discussions now, that an anthropologist from Mars would recognize as no different from, for example, strong, Christian fundamentalism. We don't happen to use the word religion to refer to it, but an outsider coming into it would see it as a religion and be perplexed that anybody would resist mm -hmm. the label. So for example, the idea that white privilege is a stain in a white person that can never actually be overcome, but must be constantly attested to, that's equivalent to the notion of original sin. The idea that there will be a day when, and I'm referring to race specifically because it's my bailiwick, but many of you will be able to extend it. There will be a day when America comes to terms with racism. What does that mean? <laughs> really, I mean, just what does that sequence of words mean? What terms? Come to terms how? Exactly what events? What realizations are intended by that term? What would you imagine? It's judgment day. It's the same thing. It's that same mythical sense that there'll be some different time now, regardless of, and this is the third thing, logic and fact, how beyond a certain point it's accepted that logic and facts are something that a person can't appeal to if they've created some sort of offense in a speaker. If someone said something that someone finds offensive, and that in itself is okay. We're all familiar from various events that have happened over the past four or five years where the person who's created the offense tries to defend themselves and just digs themselves in deeper and deeper and deeper. I don't mean Roseanne. I mean, that's a rather easy case. But somebody who's more reasonable than that, where it's obvious that facts simply won't work. They just get yelled at and screamed at. This is what happens when people are not engaging in what you would call even healthy debate, but pursuing a heretic. To go against the ideology now is to suffer, indeed, what Galileo suffered. There's a religion afoot. In 1500, nobody in Europe considered themselves religious. It was just in the water. If there was a such thing as an atheist, they kept that to themselves, and there essentially wasn't. That's where we are now, and so many of the people now who are religious would resist the label because especially a modern, secular, educated person often won't like the idea of being told that they have a religion, but that doesn't mean that the analysis isn't accurate. There's a religion, and the problem with this religion is that it does mean that debate is discouraged, not absolutely stanched, but it means that too many people, especially the majority who are not up 
for being mauled, that's most people, are more inclined <laughs> to keep quiet and it gets harder and harder to discuss. Now there are two things that we have to remember. I've never met a snowflake. That analysis is wrong. It's not that students now are too delicate to hear views that they're not used to. Never met that person. It's not that. Rather, the people who are leading this kind of movement are genuinely angry. Within themselves, they have genuine aggrievement. There is no delicacy involved here. Rather, it's that people have been caught up in, and it's so easy to forget how it would feel to be somebody only 20 years old. You didn't know the time before. You didn't really know seven years before. You're only 20, you've only known one way of thinking of these things. If that's what you've taken in from your dorm, from what you've seen, and especially from social media, then you're quite sincere. You're not delicate. If you're one of these leaders, you're actually probably one of the smarter and more self-directed people. So the idea is not to tell people to stop being so delicate. They're not delicate. They're often brilliant. But we still have a problem. Second, and this is something that I think is more important than the snowflake analysis, this issue cannot be framed simply as there must be completely free speech on campus, because there mustn't. That's an oversimplification of the issue. On any college campus that I taught on, I don't want to have to hash out whether or not there should be slavery. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to discuss whether or not there should be genocide or whether or not women ever should have gotten the suffrage. There are some things where we can assume, even if there's some Martian perspective where we could see it in a different way, we can assume, because life is short, that there are things that we don't need to discuss. <laughs> and so. We don't need completely free speech. There are some things that we don't need, need to hear at all. However, the SJW ideology, and there is one, and it is a religion. It is a religious faith. That ideology tries to shut out too much. It tries to include way too much within that zone. Specifically, if the idea is that anything that can be laboriously interpreted as racist, anything that can be interpreted in that way at all, is off limits such that any speaker who comes to campus espousing it is subject to certainly being shouted down and possibly even threatened physically, then we have a problem because that's not a university. That's not civil. And Angus, I completely understand what you're saying, but that's different for me than what happened in 1964. If by chance, and I'm done, if by <laughs> chance, Mario, Savio, and the gang. And it'd be interesting to see that in color on clear film. It looks <laughs> mythical because of the black and white. If they, with modern social media, could keep anybody who disagreed with them from saying anything at all, not just Clark Kerr, but anybody, that wouldn't be any good either. Social media didn't let them do that. And it's not Trump. Social media did this. It's a problem. I find that it makes it harder for me to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the problem going last is like you agree too much and so many of your points have been made. Uh, my name is Jason Stanley. I teach uh, philosophy and linguistics at Yale University, sort of the flip of John who teaches linguistics and philosophy. Uh, and uh, my, my first, I wrote a bunch of books on epistemology and philosophy of language and then turned to working on propaganda. And I have a book coming out on fascism. Um, so on the question, uh, that was asked, uh, I do think there's a free speech crisis. Uh, but I have to uh, say in what sense I think that. Um, I think too much in these debates, there are two incompatible presuppositions that are made. The first presupposition is the campus is the world, and the second presupposition is the campus is not part of the world. <laughs> uh, I make the opposite of those two. I think the campus is part of the world, uh, but it's not the whole world. And I think that you have a free-flowing interaction, as history shows us, between the world and, camp and the campus. In William Sheridan Allen's book uh, about Thalberg, how a, not, how a town that voted for social democrats became Nazi, um, he talks about ultranationalists in 1928 in the Volkische Parteien giving, uh, giving performances and speeches and being shut down by the university students 
and BRICS flew. These were open conflicts. University students facing ultranationalists, Milo, what happens at Berkeley and, and, and Milo when people are sent out as provocateurs to create these situations. This is not new and it's not local. Um, so there's a complex interaction between the world and the university. Uh, and I think there's a free speech crisis because the far right has taken over the vocabulary of free speech. Um, uh, in the, the, the uh, Jeremy Joseph Christian, who, who murdered two people in Portland, uh, when he came into the courtroom said, uh, said, this is America, if you don't like free speech, get out, you know. Uh, too much, the free speech vocabulary is being co-opted for, I would argue, illiberal purposes by the right, and that's a crisis. When, when survey polls ask young people, or any of us, what do you think about free speech? They're not responding just to the reference of, the, of free speech. They're responding to the social meaning of the terms. And social meanings change, and they get affiliated with different groups. And when you get bogged down in certain kinds of terminology, then you tend, it tends to affect your thinking. So that's why I try to avoid expressions like social justice warrior. I try to avoid the crisis vocabulary as much as possible. Now, uh, uh, because I, and, and especially expressions that were deliberately brought in for political purposes, like political correctness. I worry that when we traffic in such vocabulary, then we prepare ourselves to see the world in a certain way. And so we should try to just change the vocabulary all the time. Um, so now on to the campus issue. Uh, I mean, I think that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, what's happening in campuses also needs to seen, be seen in historical perspective. I'm not, uh, I think that when you come into, I think when Haidt and Lukianoff wrote their piece, uh, they framed a general narrative and they have a certain theoretical perspective. But the problem then is that you can't see nuance and difference between different, say, events. One thing that's been problematic so far at this conference, Angus just discussed, where are the people from the University of Alabama, from the University of Missouri? Where are the, is it really the case that what's going on at Reed College is the same as what's going af, af, uh, on at the University of Missouri? You tell Storm Irvin or the members of Concerned Students 1950 at, at the University of Missouri that they're snowflakes or social justice warriors when they had nooses hung on their doorknobs. Uh, so that's a very different situation than Reed College, than other, other universities. So when we, we just talk about elite private education and not like, you know, uh, Americans who didn't have overly structured backgrounds because they didn't come from backgrounds of wealth, then, you know, we're obscuring, we're, we're creating a false picture of the general thing. And I think that the different campus movements had different causes. Uh, Missouri led to Yale. Were there mistakes in, in, uh, in method? Sure. Uh, but, uh, but there were some good outcomes uh, as well. Uh, and I'll conclude by just saying something uh, about, that I think has been an echo of, of what John said. Like, um, there are certain theoretical moves that I think I'm, I find problematic. First of all, I don't think John Stuart Mill is Jesus Christ. I, I don't think that you, you know, just by invoking John Stuart Mill, you shut down conversation. I teach, I teach on liberty. I've taught it for 25 years. There are seriously problematic arguments in on liberty. Mill thinks that unless you argue out with an opponent, then you don't know your position. So because I haven't refuted external world skepticism, I don't know that you're in front of me now. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a very plausible argument. Mill makes the assumption of, at any rate, I'm not gonna get it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so uh, so uh, I think that when people are like, oh, well, we need viewpoints on every side when an issue is politically important. Well, this is already raised. Well, Al Qaeda is politically important, so that would lead you to think that we need Al Qaeda representatives on campus. I don't think we need Al Qaeda representatives on campus. We can actually figure out, you know, p people, Steven Pinker argues that uh, the evidence supports the view because, that Ashkenazi Jews are more intelligent generally than others because of their history of money lending. But presumably, Pinker is not going to want people on campus who argue, faculty members who argue that. Ashkenazi Jews are more materialistic and greedy because of their history of money lending. So you got to make, you know, uh, so there's a lot of sort of theoretical moves that I think need to be queried and questioned here.
Well, I'd love to introduce a couple of things here. Um, first, I mean, context and subjectivity are ideas that have been talked about in general, but just to, to introduce them explicitly. Also, uh, Heterodox's statement, I think, is very instructive when it describes the problem that they hope to solve with viewpoint diversity. Um, and I'll, I'll just read it quickly. For simple problems or fully resolved technical matters, there is little need for viewpoint diversity. It goes on to say, but for wicked problems, in quotes, uh, those that can be framed in multiple ways and that may trigger passions and partisan motivation, viewpoint diversity is essential. Now, subjectively, <laughs> it's very hard to say what those things are, but it's important to note that the, the credo of heterodox does acknowledge that there are various points of view that we are not necessarily advocating there ought to be people on campus representing those views. And that is an obvious principal challenge that I would love to have you all address. Relatedly, you know, we move from epoch to epoch and in certain respects from crisis to crisis. Uh, at, the, at the current moment, um, it is almost certainly the case that I might be like the least concerned person in here about the current state of our politics. And that's not because I voted for Donald Trump. Um, it's for other complicated reasons. But I do wonder about the subjective vantage point that you know, a broad community of people who share that perspective, who perhaps go out and occasionally find evidence to support that, sub that perspective where they look. Um, I, I, I'm, I'll wrap it up this way. When I look at this issue, the challenge that I have is gaining sufficient perspective to be able to say, what's happening now is substantially different from what has happened in the past. There are always things that we can't say in polite company that good and decent people can't observe or won't observe if they want to be liked. For those of us who are deeply concerned about this issue, um, and for those of us who aren't, how do we know when we have passed that threshold? Um, and for those who are concerned about things as they currently stand, how do we know when the crisis has abated and we're simply back in this more even place? Uh, certainly when it was the Vietnam War in the 1970s with the radicals movement, with the radicals, the left-wing radicals, there were certain concerns. Um, certainly we already mentioned the Iraq War and it seems as though that was eons ago in some ways, but it wasn't very long ago. Um, so I'll, I'll let you perhaps respond to that uh, in general. And obviously we've only got about 15, 15 minutes here, uh, but perhaps we just you know, roll down. First off, I want to point out, and I think Heather and Brett would want me to point this out, Evergreen is a public institution. And I would say that I think part of the reason why it looks like what we're hearing from is the private institutions is because, frankly, they have the money and the resources to lead in a lot of problems in academia. It's not that these things don't matter at public institutions and not that people aren't fighting for it, but it's the people at the more elite places that have more power and more money to deal with things. So just briefly on that. But I would say, you know, as somebody who's been on university campuses for 25 years, it does feel like a crisis to me. And the crisis to me is a crisis of not caring about facts, right? The crisis to me is when I end up in these situations like I did at Wellesley College where I'm there to give a talk and an email is circulated about what my alleged views are on transgender people that is completely wrong. And I'm told by some students, it doesn't really matter whether or not I believe that. What matters is that that is my public reputation, therefore I should not be allowed to be there. It's like we don't have the most basic common understanding of what a university should be about, which is, yes, we should have programs in arts and music which are not about truth seeking, but for the most part, most of us should care about truth seeking and should have a basic concept that if we're going to pursue justice, we have to care about what actually happened, right? We have to care about the truth. And instead, what I end up running into all the time is what we've talked about, this kind of throwing down of the identity cards in order to decide who wins. It's such a stupid card game. It's such a simplistic card game that it doesn't feel like an intellectual game at all. There doesn't seem to be any intellectualism under it. Instead, it's this sort of attitude of, and, and I, I was talking with Robbie last night on the walk back to the hotel. We find this even in Title IX investigations, right, where it doesn't really matter what actually happened. What mattered is who is belonging to a party that is understood to be historically oppressed. 
And so I feel like it is a crisis. I, I feel that when I'm on campuses now, I'm in a situation that is radically different from 25 years ago. And I'm speaking as somebody who came to the university in feminism and remains a feminist. You know, I would point out that the first people arguing for viewpoint diversity was feminists arguing for a feminist standpoint epistemology. Right. When we said 25 years ago, having more points of view gives you less confirmation bias and a better chance of getting truth, we were told, oh, that's silly girls, right? But we were there, and I'm happy to say now what's really happening at Heterodox is feminist standpoint epistemology. Um, but the problem is, I mean, those were feminists, and I was part of that, and I'm still part of that, feminists who believed that we did want to get closer to truth. That's why we wanted more diversity within the ranks of people doing research was because it would help with confirmation bias and it would help ask new questions. So I do think there's a crisis because there's this attitude that asking difficult questions is somehow dangerous. I, I, I think that this question of truth and this question of subjectivity is a really important one and I think it's, it's one that, that deserves a bit more unpacking. I, I always go back to, to what Niels Bohr said, that the, the opposite of a, a true statement is a falsehood, but the opposite of one profound, to, one profound truth may well be another profound truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I hear echoes of that in the heterodox statement, right? That there are certain things that we can say this is true, this is false. There are other things where we, we have to say that, that you know, uh, there are truths which may clash with each other and there's no winner that comes out, right? That there are truths uh, that, uh, that can be existing in opposition with each other and in tension with each other without one of them having to be accepted and one of them having to be rejected. Uh, and knowing the difference between those two kinds of truth, the one where there is one and the one where there are multiple and they're gonna have to contend with each other, is not as simple as a lot of people would like to pretend that it is. Uh, for me, having been on campus as an undergrad in the late 80s and early 90s as a student activist, I, I, I see a lot of resonance with what was happening back then uh, with what's happening right now around issues of identity politics. This was the moment that political correctness became a really big thing. And one of the things that I think is, is really important in terms of the role of social media on this stuff is that there, everybody is so much more exposed. Oops, did my, no, there we go. Everybody is so much more exposed than they were 10 years ago, even. And that includes the activists themselves. Uh, that if you go on Twitter and you say something intemperate, you can be chased out of your college, you can wind up on a right-wing website, you can, you know, you get quoted in your student newspaper and you can find yourself the subject of three New York Times op-eds within four days, right? <laughs> that's scary and that's weird. And so one of the things that I think is really, really important to note is that the conversations that are happening among activists behind closed doors are often very, very different from the conversations that they're having in the public sphere because you don't have the freedom to explore, to be experimental, to screw up, in public that you used to. I, I always say, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this, I always say when I'm speaking on a campus that the, the one thing that you need to have if you want to be a campus activist uh, is the willingness to be wrong in public. That the willingness to be wrong and to learn from your wrongness and to accept the consequences of your wrongness, all of that is crucial to developing as, as an activist and as a person. But the costs of wrongness are incalculably higher than they were just 10 years ago, and that, that does scare me. If I, if I could just ju jump in on the, the social media side of it, and I think that you know, some, a lot of you are probably on Twitter, and as someone who's on Twitter quite a bit but trying to cut down, it's striking, it's striking to me how the incentive structure in, in the Trump era works because I see tweets that get you know, thousands of retweets and likes that are just banal anti-Trump statements. And that's what, that's where the incentive structures lead a lot of people who might otherwise have interesting, creative things to say, but that doesn't actually get you a lot of play when it comes to, you know, whatever our tribe might be. And this is particularly on the left. 
Um, and that's why I think, in, you know, and this, is, this is why it's not just a question of truth, it's a question of how do we encourage interesting ideas that may not be the truth but are useful because they, they push us to have interesting, productive, fruitful debates. And I worry that as, as someone who is on the left and wants my side to be a little bit better on these things, a lot of the interesting, provocative debates, I think, are happening on the right now, and that's concerning to me. I want, um, and someone was, uh, you know, someone was saying this um, last night in, in, a conver in a conversation that, and I think it may, there may be something to it, there aren't a lot of, if you look at white male liberals on, on the left, so left liberals, um, not a lot of, in, if they're millennials, they don't really have interesting views. They're, I mean, they just, uh, uh, and it's sad. They, um, and, um, I feel shame. <laughs> yeah. And, and I know they're, ca I know some of them are capable of it, and the, let's be, and, uh, and, Some, at least. So, okay. But, uh, but uh, also, to be honest, one reason that I can get away with saying things that are controversial is because on the, on the sort of totem pole of disadvantaged groups, sure. luckily, I'm in one of the most disadvantaged groups in the Trump era. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually worked, that's really worked in my favor. And, I'll, and I'll, you know, I'll just be straight up about it. People have to be a lot more careful. Um, they can't accuse me of being Islamophobic because I've been a very outspoken opponent of Islamophobia. I think Islamophobia is real. The Southern Poverty Law Center may, might disagree with that. I think they've managed to qualify some people who happen to be uh, Muslim as Islamophobic. Yeah. That, that, yeah, th there's one person who, who was included on that list. Yeah. That is true. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, anyway, I don't, um, but I, I, I do think that, um, so it, it's also, a, the, there is this question of what what the left is going to move towards, and I think that that's why there's also, you know, so, socialists mm -hmm. and Bernie supporters and people who write for Jacobin. I think that that's where a lot of you see a lot of interesting ideas coming more on the left side rather than the center left, which is very much stuck in this narrow liberal consensus of being obsessed around issues of race in the kind of religious manner that I think John was talking about that's fundamentally about purity and it's not about having interesting, useful ideas. And I saw your hand go up and before you chime in, I wanna ask, related to this kind of change in attitudes and mm -hmm. the fact that there are certain things that are totally off limit, racism is off limits. Mm -hmm. The spectrum of things, however, that are considered racist might evolve as you pointed out earlier, Jason. Um, it seems like both of these things are, in fact, happening. Could you talk a little bit about that as you respond to the broad thing? This, you can take it even larger. This is what's, what's frightening to me and what I would like to see stop. This is how we would know that there had been a major change in the tone of things. And it's the sort of thing that one often doesn't even notice within the current debate because it's so much a part of the scene. I came into academia in the late 80s, and I came into it as just a geeky person, interested in my languages, interested in weird stuff. I wanted to learn about things and learn how to think about them. It took me about 10 years to fully understand what the problem was. Whenever I would try to say something that I thought was interesting in print, especially after I became a professor, two times I got in major trouble. Once was during the grand old Ebonics controversy. Back in 1997, I ran afoul. And I'm not going to get into the details, but I said something that was completely anodyne and was you know, practically asked to leave the planet by a certain group of people. And I had no idea what I had done. Then I studied Creole languages, like Jamaican Creole, Papiamentu Haitian Creole. I've said some completely empirical, you know, admiring things about those languages and been told again and again, you know, I'm known as a public linguist. There's a small cadre of linguists who think of me as the sinister charlatan because of these things that I've said. And frankly, they're wrong. However, <laughs> the reason they don't like what I've said is because it happens to run afoul of this certain religion that we're talking about. I have found, basically, that in terms of being an academic, there are a great many people with massive influence who think that the soul of being an academic or intellectual person is to battle power differentials. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. As opposed to, now that's this, 
And that's a noble goal, and I've always thought of myself as part of it. But being an intellectual or being an academic is this. And you find that there are these people in suits who think that really what you're supposed to be doing is the little tiny thing of battling power differentials. And if you're not doing that, and if you're not doing it right, then you are the devil. Now, most people would never put it that way, and that's just what I mean by how powerful it is. If a young me, of course I'm still young, but if a younger <laughs> me could come into academia now as just a stupid Urkel nerd trying to find things out, and wouldn't run up against that purse-lipped person who doesn't know that all they're really interested in is battling power differentials, then things would have changed. So just, I mean, I'm a great admirer of John and his work. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> no. So I'm going to challenge John's self-representation. Please do. Uh, I mean, John works on Creoles. John works in an area in sociolinguistics that comes from, in part, chapter one of Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks and the, poli the politics of Creole, like power differentials. Sociolinguistics is an area that emerges from precisely thinking about power differentials. And John's work is on language and power. So when he does this in public, I'm a little, I mean, I think there's, I agree that there's lots of ways to get at truth, but one way is thinking about power differentials as John's academic work reveals. Can I, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question yes. about that, given the, the brevity of that response? Um, related to this issue, I mean, social justice often comes up in the context of these conversations, and you eloquently defended your position earlier. I wonder about the dangers uh, of potentially missing a crisis that might be blooming related to social justice. There's, there's certainly. I have to imagine that there is some risk of potentially overstating your case when talking about these power dynamics and perhaps missing the, the boat if, in fact, a belief system is, in fact, in existence amongst people who have good and noble aims but perhaps take them to extremes and, as a result, end up undermining some of these core principles that we all agree on. Well, you know, I, I'm going to be the first person to criticize like what ha happens to Alice uh, and you know the some of the excessive mistakes in method um, but right now I mean of course politics is always risky so you're always making a bet when you make a political take a political stand but to me right now I see looking around the world at far-right movements and governments looking at the shutting down of Central European University for being Marxist and gender theory, shutting down of St. Petersburg University in Russia, the best university in Russia for gender studies and cultural Marxism. Right now I see the university being used as a political pawn. And yes, uh, I think there's the excesses that people complain about, but context, we have to think about what political moment we're in. And I would say protecting the university is, a, you know, is going to be essential in this moment. And we can debate about whose fault is it. Is it the protesters' fault for bringing Republicans to distrust universities? Or is it the, the people tarring them with labels like snowflake? But that's a debate between friends, ultimately. You know, ultimately, we need to say the university, we need to protect the university against being this, this demonized pawn. And so that's what I'm going to do. Oh, thank you. I believe there are some microphones floating around. Do we have some folks already with questions, perhaps? Looks like it's coming. Here comes the 10 minute question. All right. Hi, I'm, uh, oh, sorry, did I? Please. Oh, so I'm Samantha Harris from FIRE, and I loved, I, you all had great things to say, so interesting. John, I have a question for you specifically, which is, um, you know, you mentioned, I love the, the whole religion thing, super interesting. Um, you mentioned that, you know, you say you don't think we should have total free speech. There are some things you don't want to have to rehash. Um, and, you know, I agree. I don't want to have to rehash certain things either. But my question for you would be who on campus and off campus too, who gets to, who decides, who makes those decisions that certain things are now off the table? That is a very good question. And because we're talking about how real life works and things that are complex as opposed to things that are uninteresting. There is no easy answer, and I'm going to go there. I'm going to go with there. Everybody, everybody get ready. Race and IQ, yes, that is really a tough one. 
Some people could articulately say that that is something that should be debated, that there are difficult empirical and ethical issues and that people should be brought to campus who have this and that to say about it. Some people would say that no, that shouldn't be debated and that as far as the pluses and the minuses, the, the damage outweighs whatever benefits would come from it. Now, who decides? I would say that people on both sides of the ideological fence should be able to have a civilized debate about it. Somewhat spirited, of course, but the idea being that nobody is chased out of the room being beaten over the head. Now, I thought about that particular issue long and hard, and I wrote a piece about it, and I thought, no, I don't want that on campus. I am completely open to being told by other people, as I was, and none of them were devils, that no, it should be debated. And so there are, there are issues like that in the middle. It should be debatable. At this point, it seems to me that it isn't, and that's what worries me. Could I just jump on that for one second? I, I think it's really important when we're looking at these questions to understand the campus as an institution, right? Because who gets to decide is ultimately people on the campus and there's gonna be a system, right? I believe that if a student group wants to invite somebody to campus, the university shouldn't overturn that decision. However, I also believe that if a student group decides to bring somebody to campus and they are protested and then they change their mind, that they have to have the right to change their mind and disinvite somebody. So I think one of the things we who, really- Who changed their mind? The folks who decided to bring the person. Oh, I see. Right, okay. so if, if, if you wanna bring somebody, if you've decided that, you know, if I've decided that I wanna bring Charles Murray, right. and then you come and you protest, and then we also sit down, one or the other or both, and right. you're like, actually, dude, really gross. Right. And I decide, you know what, I don't wanna give him a platform, I don't wanna create that environment, I don't wanna create that, and I change my mind, that's not a failure of free speech. That's a success, I think, of dialogue and, and norm building Talk between the two of us. Sure. Well, hey. that, that does bring to mind the, the namesake of Alice's book, who, I mean, Galileo is practicing uh, or advocating for this system of heliocentrism at a time when the plurality of belief is that the earth is at the center of everything. Um, I mean, well, the Isn't plurality that, that, of belief was that the church was at the center of everything. Well, that, that, is, that as well. Um, but there's still a plurality of belief, and it sounds like we make a decision is a plurality of belief. If we're at the end of all knowledge, then it's not particularly scary. But if there are still things that are emergent that we could all collectively be wrong about, does that make anybody nervous? Well, I think a really tough case is the Amy Wax situation, and that, that's a little bit different because then you're talking about students who have Amy to take Wax. a course, <laughs> and then it gets into questions of whether, um, whether, whether students, I don't want to say harmed, but whether they can actually have the full educational experience with a professor who may have, and Glenn Lowry and, and John were, were talking about this on their podcast, but also, I listened to Glenn Lowry's interview of, of Amy Wax, and what, what struck me as what, what would for me be a red line is when Glenn asked Amy Wax, um, you know, do you consider black students inferior? And I was expecting that Amy Wax would just very easily say, of course I don't. She didn't say she thinks black students are inferior, but she refused to unequiv unequivocally say that she, she didn't think that. Mm -hmm. And then I think to myself, if you're a black student taking a first year course at a law school, um, I personally would not wanna be a black student taking a class with Amy Wax because she may think, I don't know what she thinks about my, my status as an individual who can, um, in the educational experience. So that, that's where I thought to myself, I, I, uh, that might be, that's a tough case. And I, I don't know, where, where all of you stand on that, but that, that's a different question than someone coming on campus and giving a speech and it's optional to go. This is a case where you have to take her course in certain situations. But the solution is not for Amy Wax to lose her job. No, no. Not, but, as, and you're not saying that. But, yeah, yes. but, it may but be, it may be appropriate to say, well, maybe, you sh maybe uh, the course, the fre freshman students or what, first year students, you know, should they be required to take a course when they may feel like they won't be get they won't get a fair hearing. It's a real issue. So, yeah. Well, can, can we uh, maybe get the next question and perhaps it'll be something else related to this? Yeah. Um, Marty Rochester, University of Missouri, St. Louis. I have a question or comment for Professor Stanley. Uh, Steven Pinker, who I don't think is here, but is one of the leading members of the Heterodox Academy, has said that the idea, the main idea that universities have about diversity is have students who look different but think alike. 
and that is think mostly liberally, not conservatively. And there are any number of studies that show liberal hegemony and domination uh, in the propofessoriate among liberals, not conservatives. So, uh, and I would add, by the way, that the main f one of the main faces at the University of Missouri uh, 2015 situation was a Melissa Click, far left professor, uh, who called for muscle to prevent a uh, uh, journalist from from uh, filming uh, student protesters. So I question whether the far right, uh, whether the onus should be on the far right. So that's just so one point I would make. Second, and, and let just, if I can only just add one other thing very quickly with regard to Professor Johnston, I, I thought I heard you say that civility may actually be bad, and I just would fundamentally respectfully disagree with that. So, <laughs> kind of a question. So, <laughs> first of all, uh, let me say unequivocally that a democracy requires honest Republicans and honest conservatives. And if we don't recognize that, we're not doing a democracy right. We need people, you know, the pr if you look at the history of the past and when far right movements arose, it's because the conservatives collapsed or far left movements arose. The, the, the sort of center left collapsed. So I'm, you know, we need, uh, we need p viewpoints from across the political divide. Let me uh, make a point about Melissa Click, she lost her job. Um, she lost her job for, an, for a, uh, she was fired. The University of Missouri campus has been incredibly attacked by the legislature, as you know. Um, again, we could argue about whose fault that is, but you know, I'm here to protect universities. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, so I, as far as Pinker's comment, um, you know, is the University of Alabama or University of Mississippi students, it's not public-private divide, it's also South-North. Is it really the case that the University of Missouri, University of Mississippi, University of Alabama is a vast swath of, of liberals? I gave a talk at, the, at one of those universities, I shouldn't say which, and, uh, and I, all I, I quoted Du Bois, and all I quoted him as saying was that the Civil War was due to slavery. And I looked up and a whole row of students were recording me like this. <laughs> and I was like, you can't get fired for this at Yale. <laughs> you know? so, so I think there's a general problem. And people need to, and you know, we can, you know, if you focus on certain universities, you're gonna think it's liberal hegemony, or I don't really like the word liberal there, but. Well, I'm not gonna tell math departments to hire Republicans. We've only got about six minutes, so I'd love to get the next question if we can. Yeah. Hey, I'm a graduate of the University of Notre Dame just recently, and one of the founders of a student organization. So I have a similar question to the first one, but from a slightly different angle. And it goes back to Shadi's comments at the beginning, where you said you guys didn't often debate pronouns because you were focused on the Iraq war. And a fundamental reality is that universities have limited amounts of time, limited amounts of space, and limited amounts of money. And so at what point, in addition to controversy, in addition to agreement, when, does the, when do those constraints come in? If a student leader comes and asks me, I want $10,000 to bring in a flat earther to debate a round earther, like, do I, is it my responsibility to let them have that debate, or should we de be debating what I consider, or what we society consider more important issues? And so it's still deciding, I guess, the question of what is okay for the realm of debate, but more so from, a, from the standpoint of when we have limited resources, do we have a responsibility to talk about the things that are most pressing and most important? Well, I, I would say that the reason that we weren't debating pronouns on campus 25 years ago is that uh, trans students were forced into the closet and had no room to, to participate in those debates. I think, you know, it's not like nobody cared. Well, we were actually debating pronouns 25 years ago. I was there, <laughs> and the debate was this. We were trying to shift the language to he and she, and shift the language from <laughs> mankind to humankind, right, right. and we were told we were snowflakes who couldn't understand That's that right. he meant she, That's and right. mankind meant humankind, <laughs> and, well, we won. And there was a gender debate, and it was productive and useful, and it helped a lot of women. That's right. That's right. A, That's a, absolutely a right. Question, That's absolutely right. A question related to that, though. Were there not caricatures at the time of people who were making what, at this point, we would all regard as very reasonable I was requests? absolutely mocked by yeah. my professors for bothering to bring this up. Absolutely. So no, it was the definitely that kind of thing. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, don't cut me off. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, I mean, to my mind, the problem with these celebrity speakers being cra paid crazy amounts of money to come in and then we have to pay for all the security is most of them are not intellectuals. So why are we spending university money on non-intellectuals? I mean, I, I think the most basic question should not be can we tolerate this point of view? It's is there any academic content here? Is there anything that looks like research-based thinking, any kind of innovative thinking here that is something like what we would expect at a university level? Something that will educate an undergraduate to a higher level? Or are we just bringing in somebody to shout slogans so everybody can tweet it and argue about it? So that, to my mind, is where the waste of money comes in. Right. Take the last one there. Uh, hi, my name is Tessa Lena. First of all, I want to thank you. Now, I come from the arts where people talk a lot about the role of technology companies in cultural shifts. So I wonder, so theoretically, if people pre-pass their opinions into a format that is digestible to uh, computers, machines, building AI, it is good for them, right? It is good for companies like Google and other technology companies. And that probably changes people's mentality. So I wonder, if you think that educating students on the role of technology or how to interact with technology would be beneficial to bringing up people who are more diverse or more tolerable just on the physical level. The role of technology? Technology literacy is certainly something that needs attention, but more and more, I'm happy to say, more and more public schools are actively doing technology literacy and media literacy. And the more of that that we can do, I think the better off we will be. I actually see a lot of hope at what's happening in K through 12. We heard some stories earlier about lousy teachers who have the attitude that if students sort of have friends, that that's a problem. Um, and certainly that would be a problem. But I would say, for example, so my son just turned 18 two days ago. He went through the East Lansing Public Schools anti-bullying program. There's some excess there in terms of the intercultural dialogue program, which requires everybody to testify to their privilege. You know, it backfires and it's problematic. And then the kids go play. Uh, what, what's the name? Cards Against Humanity is the name. <laughs> they then play in the back room. And they have very reproductive discussions from that. But you know, some of the anti-bullying programs, for example, I've seen tremendous positives from that. So that what I see in my son's class is the ability to speak up when something is going wrong. And so the other day, for example, I was at an ultimate Frisbee game of our high school versus another high school. And one of the kids on our team was being obnoxious to the other team. And two of the kids from our team went over and said to him, this is not appropriate and it's not okay. We're here to have a good sportsman-like experience. And what they were doing was exactly what they were taught in their anti-bullying program, but they did it really well. They didn't shame the kid, but they did get him to shut up and behave himself in a way that allowed everybody to enjoy themselves without an unnecessary tension. So I, I do see a lot of hope, actually, in this stuff. And I wish universities would pay more attention to technology literacy and media literacy especially. I would much rather that students be taught media literacy than that they be swept into a pseudo-diversity program and taught that they have too much privilege. We've got a, about 60 seconds. Anybody want to try to speak we, something in? One thing I think that has emerged as a consensus among otherwise different views, not just today at this panel, but before, is that social media has created a technology can't be easily assimilable. <laughs> and social media has changed everything. Uh, and we, have, we need discussions, theoretical discussions, across different ideological divides. When you're hit by one side, you tend, it tends to polarize you. But social media has really changed things, and we need to reflect on that in the academy. Well, moderator's prerogative, uh, one thing that I wish we had had an opportunity to talk about is the extent to which we've actually seen radical shifts in political perspectives on important issues in, uh, at a pace that seems pretty unprecedented. I mean, first you have the civil rights movement in the 1960s, um, now we have sort of gay marriage more recently, um, and in the last few years, the perspective on immigration. If you are a restrictivist who wants to build a fence along the southern wall, now we call it a wall, Bill Clinton called it a fence, you are a racist. Um, there is something interesting that seems to be happening here. Perhaps technology has a role in that, but certainly the pace, uh, the change of, uh, or evolution of our perspective seems uh, interesting. Uh, but at any rate, thank you all for thank a great you. panel. Thank you. Next, we're going to head downstairs. You have about 30 minutes to grab some lunch, and the uh, lunch program will start at, well, 
30 minutes from now. And then we'll come back up here for a conversation with University of Chicago President Zimmer at 110.